of the things that we did uh, growing up was that we would, on Sunday mornings at Hebrew school uh, in about the 1980s, we would all go in the springtime to participate in the Solidarity Sunday marches for Soviet Jews. I don't know if anybody here remembers doing that. It was something that um, I remember very deeply. I remember being surrounded by thousands of other Jews uh, in New York City, and we were yelling, let my people go, let my people go. Am Yisrael Chai, the Jewish people lives. These were incredibly important experiences for me as a young man. So attending these events as a young man, I remember that I felt a very strong sense of Jewish peoplehood out there rallying, let my people go, Am Yisrael Chai. It didn't matter what language that we spoke. It didn't matter that the Jews in New York City and in Russia had different cultures that they were part of. It didn't matter that we had different religious practices. Something connected us all to one another. Something in our blood, some deep, deep Jewish essence, some set of core identity transcended the differences that we had from one another. I've spent a lot of my professional life trying to understand that idea of Jewish peoplehood. But even with my own experiences that were so powerful to me at the time, I wonder today whether or not there is a future for Jewish peoplehood. And that is what I want to ask tonight. Does Jewish peoplehood have a future in the 21st century? Now, I'm a historian. Historians have this very frustrating habit of answering important contemporary or future questions by looking at the past. So I apologize for that, and I ask you to bear with me because I think there will be fruits to this sort of an investigation and a historical journey. What I would like to do is to go back and to trace the origins of this term in the American Jewish community of the 1920s and 30s. And then I'd like to look at how changing ideas of nationality and race and ethnicity have had such an impact and challenged the notions of Jewish peoplehood as it was initially conceived. And at the end of the talk, we will consider whether or not there is a future for Jewish peoplehood in America. And if so, what will it need to look like? So when I started to investigate Jewish peoplehood as a scholar, I went back to the sources to see where this term came from in the Jewish tradition. And I started with the biblical texts and looked at other ancient sources. And what it became clear to me as I looked for peoplehood in these texts was that it wasn't there. Not only was a Hebrew translation of the word peoplehood or the Hebrew original of peoplehood not there, but the very fundamental concept that I grew up with, I couldn't find in the Bible or subsequent Jewish literature and texts. Now, it's not at all that collectivity and notions of Jewish collectivity don't appear in the Hebrew Bible. I'm sure we can all think of different concepts and terms from various Jewish sources that highlight different aspects of what unite Jews to one another. So we have aspects of theology, we have aspects of languages and culture, and we have terms and aspects that focus on tribal ties. For example, B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel. But there is something new in the modern period. What's new in the modern period is all these different concepts of what connects Jews to one another are pushed through this funnel and out pops a very general, ambiguous idea that there is a unity and solidarity that links Jews together. So the emphasis shifts from the terms that exist in the Jewish sources that focus on what connects Jews to one another to a modern idea that Jews are connected to one another. And it's the fact of connection that's much more important than the actual content of the connection. So this explains to me why it might be that if my great-great-grandfather were to see the marches that I experienced as a young boy for Soviet Jewry, he would have been totally shocked that the expression of Jewish collectivity that meant so much to Jews of the 20th century was about politics and solidarity and about marching for thousands of people in front of the United Nations. 
That would not have been his vision of Jew Jewish peoplehood. And it wasn't even possible until the middle of the 20th century. So what historians like to do is to figure out where does it come from? Where does that word Jewish peoplehood come from in the concept? Well, thanks to Google, we actually have a great tool for trying to understand how words and terms develop. This is a graph that shows the occurrence of the term Jewish peoplehood in all of the different books published in English from 1800 until quite recently. And you notice something quite clear. This is a totally new word that doesn't even exist until the 1930s. And then something really interesting happens. All of a sudden, in the 1940s, the word explodes. So this is clearly a new term. And what I wanted to figure out is, what happens in the 1930s and 40s that created the concept of peoplehood that was so important to me as a young boy growing up in New York City? The answer has to do with Zionism and Jewish nationalism. This is Theodore Herzl, the founder of Zionism. And Theodore Herzl had the idea that wir sind ein Volk. We, the Jews, are one nation, people. His central contribution to modern Jewish thought is the idea that Jews are a national group as opposed to a religion with a homeland. Now, there were a number of American Zionists, like Mordechai Kaplan, who were very inspired by Theodor Herzl. By the way, as an aside, he also had a lot of ways that he challenged Herzl, but I don't have time to get into those today. But for the most part, Kaplan wanted to figure out how to translate Zionism and Jewish nationalism into an American context. But there was a problem. The problem was, do you talk about Jews as a nation, a nationality in English? This is at a time when American Jews feel incredibly insecure, even in this country, about being both an American, an American citizen, and part of a Jewish nation. So even though it's hard to believe right now, most American Jews did not support Zionism in the 1920s and 30s. So leaders like Mordechai Kaplan had to think of a new vocabulary that would accomplish a very difficult task, which is how do you be both a national group and an American citizen? He needed a new word, a blank slate, that he could define in a way that would reconcile these two opposing at the time concepts. And that word is peoplehood. And it's Kaplan who starts using that word in the 1930s. And the word takes off in terms of its significance, as you saw in that chart, following 1948 with the founding of the State of Israel. And now there were more and more American Jews who are interested in affirming the, the national identity of Jews and the centrality of the homeland, but were still a little bit concerned about saying we are a national group. And so peoplehood was a perfect solution for those groups. So we see that peoplehood developed in the 1920s and 30s in response to a very specific set of circumstances. Zionism, Jewish nationalism. So if we zoom forward 20, 30, 40, 50 years to the end of the 20th century, we realize that there are whole different ideas of group identity that dominate our conversations about what it means to be an individual and what it means to be part of a group today. Let's try to understand what these could be. Barack Obama is a great image to think about changing ideas of identity and collectivity. Obama represents multiple traditions in a single person. He's multiracial. He was born in America. At least, if you think I can say that, you'll come from me saying that. Uh, but he also spent a huge amount of his time uh, uh, internationally. And by the way, he even has a rabbi in the family. So applying a very simple system of bloodlines or geographic location or national history only captures a tiny part of what identity means today. And this trend is one that you can certainly see in the Jewish community as well. Jewish families are increasingly reflecting 
the multi-traditional, multi-ethnic, multi-religious context that the image of Obama highlights as what it means to be an American. So the imagined connection that I felt as a 10-year-old, where it was so clear to me that I and the Russian Jews across the world were all connected back somehow to this Moses figure at Mount Sinai, would make absolutely no sense to a 10-year-old today whose parents, maybe one of them is not Jewish, one of them is Jewish, maybe who was adopted from another country uh, by a Jewish family but still clearly has ethnic or national roots somewhere else. The argument, the argument that Jewishness is in our common core and will follow us from birth to death does not reflect the way in which we think about diversity and collectivity today. So what do we do? Can we save Jewish peoplehood? Is there a future for this key concept? In order to think about a future paradigm, a new paradigm for Jewish peoplehood, we have to shift from thinking about peoplehood as something connected to a national essence or political solidarity or clear boundaries to a paradigm that accepts multiple groups, divergent worldviews, and very fluid boundaries. So how do we understand this new paradigm? How do we build toward this new paradigm? One way to help start the conversation, and the good news is I'm a historian, so I don't have to solve this, but I will at least start the conversation with you tonight. Let's think about some of the questions that the old paradigm asks and look at how we could replace them with questions from a new, more applicable paradigm today. The old paradigm of Jewish peoplehood that I grew up with wanted to know, who are you? Or maybe a more precise way of articulating that would be to say, are your parents Jewish? Are you dating somebody who's Jewish? And will your children be Jewish, right? Is your essence somehow Jewish by your family and your ethnicity? The second is, what values unite us? That there are some general values that all Jews share, and a low lowest common denominator that defines Jews wherever they live. And finally, what boundaries differentiate us, our group, from you, your group? And often, these boundaries are set by anti-Semitism, uh, uh, Jewish persecution, the idea that even if Jews don't set their own boundaries, somebody else is. What do new questions look like? How do we rethink our questions? Well, here's what I would propose. We should be asking, what do you do? How do you, in your own life, make choices to integrate and be part of Jewish community, Jewish learning, uh, Jewish life? It's about your decision. Second, what is meaningful to you? How does the Jewish tradition, Jewish community, Jewish experience speak to you as an individual? Not worried about what everybody shares. What does it mean to you? And the final piece is recognizing that we're all balancing multiple allegiances and Jewish peoplehood should help us think about how we balance rather than focusing on how we maintain our differences from other folks. Now this is a major shift in understanding Jewish peoplehood. If the old model was a top-down model, it was a model that focused on unity, shared values, and an essence, and that something would be defined by the community that everybody could share. The new model is a bottom-up model. It's a model that starts with individual engagement, local communities, and multiple nodes. It doesn't have to be a center. This may look quite different than the notion of Jewish peoplehood that I experienced as a young man. And I imagine that a lot of people will be hesitant to changing notions of Jewish peoplehood. But just to inspire us to maybe push ourselves a little bit more, I want to end with a story. My wife's grandfather, Dita, attended the Citadel in South Carolina. And he used to tell a story that at the Citadel, the first time that you do something, it's a tradition. And the second time that you do something, it's a long-standing tradition, <laughs> never to be broken. And the joy and the wonder of being a historian is our job is to go back and to look at things that people think are traditions and even long-standing traditions 
and to show the first time and the second time and the third time when they actually developed and what context that took place in. And Jewish peoplehood is a great example of that because when you appreciate that what made this term so successful was how innovative and different and responsive it was to the needs of the 1920s and 30s, you realize that the best way of ensuring Jewish peoplehood for my students for the future is not to preserve the old tradition, but instead to continue the tradition of having peoplehood as an evolving and innovative concept. So I do believe that there is a future for Jewish peoplehood, but I believe its success rests on whether or not we can come up with a new paradigm that is just as radical, innovative, and challenging as the paradigm that I grew up with in the 1920s, and if we can do that I grew up with in the 1980s, and if we can do that, I'm older than I look, if we can do that, peoplehood will continue to thrive as a meaningful concept into the 21st century. Thank you.